Want you guys say something? Hello. All right, perfect. Thank you. Hello. That's weird. I don't know why it wasn't the uh, uh, things weren't jumping earlier. Anyways, this? um, the just the the audio knobs weren't working. Um, let's see how I close, close out all this stuff. Um, da, 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 da. Okay. Um, okay. <clears throat> Let's see here. Okay, so I, so I, um, let's see, I think I've got something that's just ready to be merged here. Yeah. All right, so I think I got pretty much all the test cases tested, um, or all of everything tested at this point. Um, so that's the that's the good news. So um, I'm going to do it right now, so you guys can all get the results of that. Um, Revere get pull. Um, you're not seeing what I'm doing because I'm on a different computer, but it'll come up in a second. Uh, test docs fix up. Uh, it looks like the CI passed on this branch, so I'm going to merge it in a master. Hopefully it stays passing. Um, all right, okay. Sweet. Um, so let's see, what did I just do here? We'll take a look back at it. Um, let's see. Okay. All right, so we talked about this. Um, I can't remember if this was Yash, you and me talked about this, or if all of us talked about this. Um, but we moved, okay, let me, and let me bring open some notes here. Okay, and let me also close these windows. All right, so, oops. Are you sharing your screen right now? Ah, uh, no, I'm not. I'm recording, but not sharing. I always do that. Thanks. Okay. Oh, damn it. That took us all the way to the bottom. Cool. I wonder how many pages this thing is now. 97. Wow. All right. November 10th. Okay. <clears throat> All right, so um Actually, we'll go through and we'll grab everything, and then I'll start telling you guys about this. But um, hopefully, that's hopefully now that I put it on the agenda, it didn't actually change and crash this time. This passed on a different branch, but yeah, it's always a mystery as to whether it's going to run or not. All right, um, Yash, I saw you'd been making some new issues related to Windows stuff. How is um, what? What do you want to talk about today? I'm just actually testing all the sub packages, all the oh, plugins nice. of a Windows. So one by one, I'm testing them out. Nice. So I looked at PyTorch, and I think the version with Suxum used to write the models were isn't compatible with the new version. Okay. So tests are generally failing for PyTorch. Uh, 
Okay. Because on Windows specifically, we are installing 1.7.0. Okay. And are we on, I guess, that's, I guess that's a good question for us is on the master branch. What are we, what have we been installing here? So PyTorch. Okay, 1.7.0. So it looks like we're installing 1.7.0 here. So maybe it's an issue with 1.7.0 on Windows then. Does that sound correct? Yeah, probably. Cool. <clears throat> um, Scikit is working fine. Okay. Uh, Orte Escalon isn't supported on Windows. And... I reviewed the PR that was open for Autoscalon too. Yes, I saw that. Great, thank you. Oh, it's witness does not support those or Macos. Okay, sweet. Um, we got a PR for this. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I think I remember seeing that one, so let's see. Let's jump over there. Oh, no, okay. Okay, so is he good now on this, or I need to add some other checks here again? Okay, and plug. No, there's one test that. Like, he has oh, to add a condition for this. Yeah, okay, yeah, cool. Thank you. Um, let's see. Okay. Are there, like, any other open PR you need help with? Any, like, this um, issue, I opened it, so I reviewed this PR. Yeah, th thank you. That's very helpful. Um, so, let's see. I don't think... I think at the moment, we're really... Agen got sidetracked here, so we need to... He needs to, he, he's working on this. Um, and this is sort of turned into something that I'm doing as well. Um, this guy, I think, and this guy, he just needs to run black, I think. Or, oh, no, he, oh, that's right. There's an issue with the scikit models here. Um, yeah, I'm not sure what this one is. This would be, like, if you wanted to pick this one up, cool. But I'm not sure, like, this would be, like, you would, pick up the PR and just finish it. There's not really any review things right now, but thank you for doing this one. That was, that's helpful. Um, I missed that thing that you caught, so that was great. Um, let's see. Uh, um, Okay. Um, so is that that's all from you today, um, Yash? Did you want to talk about anything else, or did you want to sort of poke around on anything? Uh, there's another thing. Like, there's just one test that is failing locally for me mm -hmm. and another system I used uh, for the Windows install. Okay. And it's failing locally and not on CI. So. Okay. Do you think it's a problem? Well, let's yeah, let's take a look. So there's one test that's failing locally, but not in the CI. Um, and oops, uh, sure. I just ran tests for XGBoost, and they're fine. Okay, so XGBoost, XGBoost. I'll I'll just run the test test. Okay. Uh, right now and see which one that was. And... Okay. Um, that's it. Like I, I'm just running the test, and I'll let you know. Cool. What test that is. Um. Yeah. Just, just let us know, and then why don't you? I, I don't know. I can't remember if we have an issue to track this, um, as a whole, or if we're just doing issues, um, sub, just issues, um, for each thing that doesn't work. But yeah, just you know, 
just put it in some kind of issue somewhere and we'll we'll track it that way if we find okay. one that doesn't work um okay Uh, I ran the test for transformers. Like it, it keeps on downloading the same thing again and again. I've noticed again that. Thing. Yeah, there's something wrong there. Okay, so and that's and that's a bug we have like overall. So that's something that we need to track um, as a whole. So let's see, bugs found. Um, so transformers keeps re-downloading. Um, when tests are running, right? Yeah, this is this is some kind of problem. We need an issue to track this. Um, I'm not exactly sure what's going on there, um, but I I noticed that in the CI. It's, I think it's been like that for a while. So it's not just a Windows thing. Yeah, it's definitely slowing down our CI, and sometimes it fails because we get you know random network errors that fail right there and then it fails. So that's annoying. So we'll, we'll want to try to figure out what the hell's going on there. Um, okay. It's actually, I the test just completed. It's test docs, test, oh, it's console test. So you were saying that it might not work. No, it's working on CI, but it's not working yet. Uh, wait, so it's a console test thing? Yeah, test docs, tensile, test console test and test functions and Oh, oh, yeah. Oh, okay. So those aren't working. Okay, okay. Um, so There's just see. one test, like, the system cannot find the file specified. And it's, it's. I guess, you have opened a temporary file named mm -hmm. standard out. Yeah. And then, I guess it's a Windows error, but it's not showing up on the CI, so I don't know. what. Okay, that's really about. interesting, yeah. Some of the tests aren't working uh, locally, but are working in the CI. Okay, let's see. Actually, this, there's another bullet point for this. Um, so that's really interesting. Yeah, we may want to count when we want to do the unit test skip on that. I think is probably the right way to handle that for now, right? And note that this is a, a Windows issue. I mean, we can go fix it too. That would work fine, right? Um, but I'm not sure. I can't. I'm. I'm not sure. That's interesting to me that it works um, in the. CI environment and not um, locally because yeah you know what the hell's up with that um, so let's see um, let's see if we can find out what the hell happened here um, okay, okay Windows is still running for that guy um, and I've, we've been getting a lot of errors on should I recently with the it keeps failing every single time. It's really annoying about that npm audit command. Um, all right, um, we're looking for test, it's test test functions. functions. All right, uh, just okay. All right. Um, for, for Windows, like yeah. Okay. This is on Windows, okay. so. And I mean, that's really interesting that it would just work. Um, okay, so what are these? What is this? Is the question here? Um, okay. Okay, so this is and which one is it that it's failing? Uh, just a second. I would guess maybe it's let's see. It's test run commands. Test run commands. Okay, well that makes sense. Because yeah, let's see, look what it's trying to do here. It's trying to say it's trying to create a pipe. And on Windows, as far as I know, pipes aren't a thing. So that's interesting that it is working. But other CI. tests, like no other tests use pipes. Yeah, yeah. 
the only yeah none of these will use pipes when you run the actual console tests they should use pipes um but they shouldn't run on windows they shouldn't run on windows have they been running on this one fails and uh, the only unique thing or the only unique thing about these tests is that it uses a temporary file yeah so i oh. think, i thought that it might be related to that because it's oh. open here and it isn't allowed to open Okay. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah. So yeah, it it could very well be that. Um cuz yeah, Windows doesn't like it when two files have um two files have a temporary file or a file open at the same or two processes have the same file open. It doesn't usually like that. Um that's interesting. Um yeah, okay, yeah, we might want to just mark we probably want to mark this one with the unit test skip. The fact that it's working in the CI is weird. Um but maybe so that's if I if I use like, if I use MKS temp, whatever I have been doing, like, would that cause an issue here? Because I'm not sure where it's being used. Yeah, you know, I think, I think, let's see. Yeah, I mean, okay, so. So instead of opening the file here, it just returns the name. So The problem with that, though, is you have to open the file to be able to use it as the standard output. Um, it has to have like a file descriptor. Um, now this is, this is now I'm wondering about what, okay, let's just see. Um, okay. Test. Let me just write this down all the way. Functions. Dot. What I have been doing is I create a temporary directory and then use MKS temp. Yeah. It returns, and that, it that, returns the file name. that, and that should, I mean, that's usually good for, um, what is it usually good for? Um, that's good for when we call the sub process and then we want, because I think it, I'm, my understanding of is in those situations, we can actually close the file before we run the sub process. But in this case, to run the sub process, we need the file open, um, is my understanding of, of, of how this works. Um, and, and I mean, you, I, I would say, you know, it might be, it's probably worth, it's worth trying, but I'm pretty sure that it won't. Uh, it won't work. Um, like you won't even be able to get to pass. It won't run the commands. I'm pretty sure. But um, like the question is, how is it working on CI? Yeah, the question is really, how the hell is it working on CI? And I think it, the the answer lies somewhere within. It's this Windows container that they're using. Um, some this some kind of Windows container that they're using that that doesn't have this limitation, um, which is interesting. Um, so let's see. Um, Let's see, Python. Um, says, right, let's just go check out the subprocess docs. And this is in the ASIC Because area. generally when Windows creates that error, like when it happens that it cannot open the file again, it throws like you don't have enough permissions or permission. Yeah, error. it's usually that permission but, error, yeah. Yeah, so this time I'm getting file not found error. The system file cannot find the specific file. Hmm, that's interesting. Um, let's see. Okay. Windows subprocess file. Let's just see what happens here. Let's see. No. I feel like somebody must have had documented this behavior somewhere, at least being like, what the hell happened, you know? Um. Python subprocess windows uh, redirect CDM to file. Found a found.
This is, yeah, I don't know. Okay, I guess this will take some digging. Um, weird, though. Um, what's what's the exact... Can you post the exact traceback somewhere? Yeah. And actually, I'll try to run it here. Too. Oops, no. That's how it looks. I can share my screen like that. Um, yeah, that would be good, too. Okay, let's see. You can see the trace bar? Uh, yes. All right, okay. P open 462. Four six two. Four six two. Uh, okay, I think we have different. We're on a different commit here now. Um, let's see. I uh, can do. A, can you do get status real quick? Uh, or like get log or something. Okay. All right. We're on run. Oh yeah. Cause I just pushed to master. All right. Let me just go back to that. I can look at that. Or uh, can you actually just pull, pull the latest version? Um, just do get pull yeah, or whatever. Sweet. Okay. Yeah. Now let's run that again. So we can see the line numbers. Cause I, So yeah, one oh four eight three. Okay. Can it be because of grip? Um, oh, yeah, maybe. I mean, Windows doesn't have grip. I mean, I don't know. Can you try running grep? Does grep exist here? Oh no. Oh, apparently it does have grip. Oh nope, it's not. Okay, maybe that's what's going on with file not found. Yeah, okay. Well, <laughs> that makes a lot more sense. Um, let's see. Well, we can so, do... Yeah. Does it, like, maybe run on a bash-based terminal there? I'll, I'll yeah, try yeah, maybe. Oh, that's a cool background. Yeah. grep works on windows with bash so it might be using a bash based terminal so that's why it's passing oh yeah that, okay that would make sense all right so let's write this down um okay so file not found error um do to Um, let's see, I is likely running with git bash or something that has crap. Um, okay, that's good, that's good to know. So, 
I mean, driven path. Okay. Um, let's see. Yeah, I wonder if there's something else we can use that's like would be present Isn't this there. in the documentation? Like, I haven't seen it in the documentation for GitHub Actions. Like, what type of terminal I use? Yeah, I haven't. I haven't seen it either. Um, it's a good question. Um, how did this pass? Oh hell yes! Um, great to see I passed on the latest run. Um, okay. Um, yeah, I haven't. I mean, I'm not. I'm not aware of which what version of anything it is either. Um, it would be. Let's see. Let's let's find out just so we know. GitHub Actions uh, Windows latest um, shell environment. I just share the link on the meet. Uh, ah, meet thank you. Like what all dependencies it already has, what it uses. Great. Language and runtime, package management, tools. Okay, it doesn't list grep, but it must have it. Because um, it's, yeah, this. Uh, 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 there's Android stuff in there, jeez. Yeah, it must have it. It must be running in like some kind of Git bash thing. Which is interesting because maybe it has bash and maybe some of this stuff will actually work. Um, let's see. Hmm. Yeah, that'll be interesting. Um, enabled Windows optional features, Windows subsystem for Linux. Hmm. That's funny. That's hilarious. There's a Windows thing which also has Linux inside of it. <laughs> um, let's see. Okay. Yeah, I'm not sure I'm really totally able to parse this. We but... should like explain more in the documentation because they have mentioned that it has Windows subsystem for Linux, like it's Windows subsystem for Linux one or two. Yeah, right. Um both of them are totally different. Both of what? Uh, it just mentions that it has a uh, yeah. Windows subsystem for Linux, but it doesn't mention that it is it version one or version two. Yeah, and how does Both one use it? And, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So okay. Well, that's that's. Let's just throw that um, link that you found in the in our meeting minutes, just so we keep that. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, okay. Okay. Good. Good catch. Oops, come on. There we go. All right, sweet. Um, all right, anything else um, here, or you're just you're still just gonna you're gonna go through the rest of these and and sort of find find more bugs and stuff, right? Yeah, I'll I'll, I'll open issues as I go. Cool. I'll I'll open one issue for all the packages and we'll just nice. Yeah, we'll I'll just yeah. make a checklist for that. That's a good plan. That's a great plan. All right, sweet. Thanks, Yash. All right. So, how are things going with you, Saksham? Uh, I haven't been doing much. I just dropped there to see what everyone's been up. To. Cool. Cool. Um, uh, let's see. But you also, still have that stuff in progress, right? So the colorization. Uh, yes. So you said that you'll take a look at the context thing. Uh, oh yes, I probably did. Let's see. Um, Oh yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's right. That was your gating factor. Um, yeah, I haven't had a chance to do that yet. Let me try to find. Let me. Okay. Let me. Let me write this. Let me write this on a physical piece of paper so it's in front of me. Um, oh, there's a battery. I needed that battery. Uh, okay. And now I need a pen. Um, Okay, one second. I gotta write this down so I remember. <laughs> no problem.
Uh, maybe I'll take a look at uh, PyTorch's new versions and see what else is failing. Okay, so. Then, yeah, I have to. Uh, I have planned on adding the uh, config class for the other, uh, the optimizer fun oh, uh, yeah, functions. Oh, right. yeah. I'll see if they have added that. I'll take a look. Okay. Sweet. Um, okay, and now I've got my pen, so I'm writing this down. Um, okay, yeah. This is why I was like looking for the branch in the last meeting because I knew I was about to forget this. Anyway, sorry. Let's see, what else did I forget to do? Um, okay, I did do this one. Um, okay, sorry, it was just your thing that I forgot to do, sorry. Okay, um, and then I wanted to duplicate this stuff down here. Sweet. And I told somebody about your colorization demo, and they were very excited to see that. So it's, uh, it's being eagerly awaited by more than just me. OK. <laughs> That's good. All right. So OK. Um, yeah, it's nice that it's nice that we're we're starting that with your with your image stuff. That's always it's it's nice that we're starting to get that because you're doing those things because that's uh, you know people people love people love images, right? It's like it's they yeah, can people really people love visual stuff. Uh -huh. Yeah, it really makes the connection to what's going on. Um, okay, so I maybe want... I was thinking about. Uh playing with some data sets regarding the uh, recent elections oh yeah that could be fun yeah uh, all right yeah oh yeah thank god that went well <laughs> well we still have to oh we're I'm, I'm holding my breath on on seeing how it goes i mean the guy's got two months left to completely screw us all so it's uh we'll see right Ooh. Yeah. all right um let's see uh, let's see okay so i wanted to just it's anybody do you, either of you guys have anything else you wanted to talk about or else i just wanted to update you on what i'd been working on So oh, I have uh, just one question. Yeah. Uh, for the spacey models mm -hmm. uh, that Manchu wrote, like, are we running a script for testing that? Uh, you mean in the CI or? Yeah, like, are there multiple tests that are dependent on shell scripts? In the CI, we're not running it for Windows. So yeah, but for training purposes like are we testing the, those ci command like terminal commands for each model or just spacey because this is the only one that's causing an error i don't okay i guess i don't i don't know where we're talking about in this situation because i didn't know that we were running spacey models within this main package ci is that is that within the main package ci or can you show me what you're talking about i'm a little bit lost uh, mod can you go into model yeah model spacey okay and I'll just see where the file is. Spacey, uh, it's running examples, NER, and train data as I said. So I guess we'll have to skip. The, we don't have this for Windows because we are using this in the documentation, right? Mm -hmm. OK, yeah. And this is OK. So this is another thing. Um, OK, yeah. And then let me just let me just go grip for this because now I'm curious. Okay, so it looks like this test case here, or wait a minute, what, okay. 
train data dot sh okay let me maybe the test that is failing is test like three tests are far passing the Here, last test this guy it's this test ner integration yeah yeah okay um okay yeah so that and that makes sense um and so okay so here's the thing is that this type of stuff this is the really next that sort of feeds in okay let me just write this down and then we'll feed into what i was going to talk about here so um uh, not working Okay, uh, spacey. Spacey, scappy, there's some other one. There's like a bunch of these that are like very variations on those five letters. Uh, a bunch of Python packages. Um, okay, so bugs found. Um, all right, okay, so I'll spacey. All right, so. Um, all right, so running bash scripts uh, to test documentation, um, bash not present on Windows. Um, um, okay, and we shouldn't expect being get bash. Um, so. Okay, so all right. Okay, so here's here's the thing. So let me go and so I finished testing. Okay, so I finished testing the tutorials um, using the new console test uh, Sphinx extension uh, that I wrote in docs ext console test .py. Um, now this thing is a bit of a convoluted mess right now, a bit of a mess right now, uh, but, oops, wrong, wrong kind of, but, um, let's see, but I have an issue to track that I want to get done before we finish the 0 0.4 release is tracking cleanup and documentation. Um, of it um so basically i'm gonna i'm gonna document what the hell <laughs> i've been working on here so that when you guys write when it when we all write more stuff it it's we're all on the same page with how we can use the the console test plugin that we now have to test the documentation um and let's see let me think if i can pull out some of these guys uh, some of these commits so test with console test um, and this one may not be very elegant here so let's see um yeah this one's a bit of a mess uh transition wise okay so let's see uh, i think there was a better one somewhere something test with console test okay um so this is in general this is sort of how I went through and, and modified these these tutorials that we had so that we could test them using this new this this Sphinx plugin, right? And so what's going to happen is is you basically anywhere you have a code block you add tests and I know I explained this last time, um, but just sort of as a refresher. And then there's a few other things like you can do replacements of stuff, um, and uh, there's like, oh, it'll start things as, as daemons, so it'll run the HTTP server in the background and assign it a random port um, specifically for the HTTP server. And then you can use the random port and be like, okay, wait, replace this port number here in this command with whatever random port was chosen. Um, and sort of just, you know, more, more, more stuff like that, basically, right? Because we're just which is the whole point here is anything that's displayed in the documentation, we want to make sure that we're testing and we want to try to get the test code basically as close to the documentation code as possible. Um, so the way we do that is we wrote the Sphinx thing to keep it, you know, basically to, to make, to make it so that we, we, uh, we read, we read the stuff that 
people are reading and that's what we're testing instead of having external test cases right because now we've we've sort of ended up with all these things in random you know all these random test files that are now running bash scripts which is a mess um so we're trying to get away from that right um so that feeds into just as a refresher that feeds into this issue with the train data.sh um, in the ner examples so the thing about this is that the reason we're running into this is because we were testing um we were testing the models their doc strings are also restructured text um and so we were doing the same thing here where we were right at first we weren't testing them now we're testing them and now when we test or currently the way that they're being tested is that we had to make those other separate test scripts so that we go and run all of these things that we would see here um, which we had to literal include so that we didn't have to parse it out and then run it. So, and then we went to moving, just run the thing. And now we have the plugin, which can extract it from the doc strings and run, then run the tests. Um, so that's the next step here. So basically the, the, so I've done it for the main tutorials. Um, so that's what just got finished here. So test all the tutorials. Um, <clears throat> and okay. So also I sort of, um okay so i sort of haven't i I've, I've tested all of the user facing stuff basically except for some of the stuff that Augen did which is a bit complicated to test um so i haven't quite set that up yet um and i think some of them had some mocking around it and then there's other ones that we have testing via various python files um you know same sort of thing um and so i didn't go through and modify those at the moment um so all of the contributing stuff has not been tested at this point um and that's partially because partially because um it's kind of specific and the test framework i'm not really sure if it's a good fit for what's going on in there yet but it will be important to go back through and make sure that all, all that stuff is correct right but sort of top priority was user facing documentation um we can always roll a 4.0.4.1 uh, release to fix this stuff um and so basically now what needs to happen is that just kind of like with those modifications that we saw there, um, ideally what we do is, is we go through and we start modifying these model doc strings, like, and actually the auto SK learn one was the one that I was going to do because we don't have examples for that. Um, that was sort of what I was going to start with here. Um, and uh, and we make it so we follow the same format, right? So and just as an example here, we can go. I can go sort of do this one right now. Um, but this is basically what what we end up doing here is you go through and anytime you see a literal include, you go with bim. This becomes pretty easy. Oops. Read file and all of a sudden okay and here's the other thing so it didn't implement support for this eof situation so there's this it's not you're not actually running most of these commands in bash because we need the ability to modify the commands and do some other things um, that mean that reconstructing the command as a bash command can be tricky so we ended up just running it we end up just running it with subprocess which also means that we should be able to run these things on windows eventually we just need to figure out like what the various quirks are um, quirks are probably related to piping between commands in that situation um, but we'll we'll need to figure that out when we get there um, but it also means that we're not tied to actually just bash so when we see something like this um, where we're, we're creating files um, we're actually just going to say, hey, you know, here's here's the file data, um, and uh, we're gonna we're gonna um, sort of just display it as a file, right? And say, hey, um, here's your file, um, and you use whatever the hell editor you want to put it in this, you know, in this file. Because I think that was also a thing that's happening is I noticed that some people see this and they get very confused about what the hell's going on here, right? Um, they're like, I don't I don't know what that syntax is, um, but they do know that when they see a file and a file name, they're supposed to put it in a file, right? Um, so we'd sort of modify it like this. And so we'd say, okay, here's the training data. And I want you to put, you know, this, this stuff 
in this file. Um, and here's the test data, and we sort of do the same thing over again. Um, so test data. Test, and then we read the file. And yeah, so we basically go through and we do this. Let me just make sure that was the correct file name, yes. Um, and then we train the model. So and so this is just so does this Does this make sense as like how one goes through and does as and modifies or writes one of these tutorials right now? Like, do you guys does this does this make sense? I'm I know I'm not explaining yeah. terribly much, but okay. Does it, is there any any questions on this? It's cool. It's cool. Okay. Cool. Awesome. Yay. Um, so yeah, this is basically you know this is this is the gist of it, and now we're pretty much right now this is this is pretty much done here. Um, so okay, and then the other thing is that looking at these backslashes here, it looks like this isn't one of the code blocks that we we got to do. Got to put an R there. Um, uh, do you get if you? I think you both know what this is, but for the sake of the recording, um, the when you put the R there, this means uh, don't. Like don't don't treat don't treat a backslash as escaping the next character. Treat this whole thing as if it's like a regex, um, and it's I think it's called a raw literal. Um, this is what the real term for it is. So let's see Python raw literal. Uh, come on, what's a real good string literals? This is old documentation, but still. Um, Yeah, let's see. Raw strings. Okay, this may not be what we're looking for. Uh, let's see. Python R. I'm not sure. I just now I want to make sure that I know what it's called for real. Um, yeah, raw string. Okay. Okay, and we're back on this page. So, uh, um, have you already added the support for like what tests will run on what OS? Um, no, I have. So yeah, so I haven't. So that's one of the things with the tabs doc, the tabs plugin that you found. Um, yeah. So the the okay. So basically, one of the next things that needs to happen is. Um, yeah, we're going to need to run them on the other OSs, right? We're going to right now. So right now it runs only on Linux uh, for all of the examples and everything that's in the docs, right? Um, now, actually, let me just finish going through this real quick and do this last one. Um, does, um, it, does it skip the test for Windows and Mac OS or does it? It doesn't. Yeah, it doesn't run those. those so the, right now, those code blocks don't have this little right there's there's code blocks but they don't have that test guy next to them um so they're not actually okay. being run um and that's basically that's one of the next things we need to do with that console test plugin is to go in there and look at it and say um and say so um so in this docs ext console test um in here the, there's a, there's a whole bunch of logic in here, and this is what I need to document because it's a bit it's a bit of a convoluted mess right now, and it's not documented. Um, and so this is I'm going to document this, and then it'll be more clear. But um, essentially, the flow of this is that um, all right. So there's this thing called you, you, with Sphinx, you'll have things. There's this thing called a builder. And a builder is like, you know, uh, there's the HTML builder, right, that builds. So they have the HTML builder, which builds the HTML version of the docs. They also have a version of the builder that builds man pages. And they have, like, one that builds a PDF. Um, so basically, they it's split into two pieces. There's the parsing of the, there's the parsing of the documentation files. And then there's the, 
into like data structures, um, Python data structures, dictionaries specifically, um, that are serializable with pickle. So anything that you parse in, you have to be able to serialize out with pickle. Um, and then there is the um, the writing out of you know basically take these dictionaries and make some you know make make me my specified format right that's what the builder does um, and let's see so and so basically what we do here is we implement this builder okay so we do usually what you would do is you would implement a new directive right and a directive so a directive is something like um, like code block or literal include anything with the dot dot and then the colons is a directive um, in sphinx speak um, and so at first what i did was i implemented ones that were like console test hyphen code block and then console test hyphen literal include but then i realized the syntax highlighting in vim doesn't work for you if you do that so then what i did is i basically went in and and what happens here is that when you load this plugin it mon it monkey it it um, people call it monkey patching um, but it basically goes through and what we do is we load the Sphinx, um, the actual directives from Sphinx. So we load code block and little, literal include. And we basically create like, it's, it's, you can't quite subclass from it, but you can use, you can create a wrapper on top of it. And you can basically say, okay, the, run function the code block run function which is basically the function that does is the parsing um let me actually use func tools wrap um and make like you know make a new run function right so assign this the run run function to to be this new function which is going to call the original function as if it's sort of like super dot run um, and that's what's happening here with funk um, so basically you can think of this sort of like we created a subclass but we can't really create a subclass because we can't up like we can't replace the class within sphinx we can only modify the class that exists there um, so this is sort of you know it's a little bit it's yeah it's 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 a little bit hacky but it the interface ends up being way nicer um, because all you have to do is add colon test colon and then all of a sudden your stuff gets tested um, and so this is this is the meat of what's going on here with the console test stuff and basically it it parses some stuff right and that happens in funk and it's like okay well that you do your regular parsing right in in your funk which is basically you can think of that as like super dot run if this was in a subclass because um, this is the run function um, and then we go through and we we start looking for um you know we we add our this is our custom logic right um so if we see this little test right colon test if there's a colon test under something then it ends up as without the colons in self.options right so we say okay if i'm supposed to test this then parse all the commands in the content um and then get all the rest of these little options that we have and there's a few other ones that i've added so basically like the you know the daemon one that i was talking about you can specify the standard in um, you can give it a little function to compare the output um, you know and only pass the code block you know maybe say the command exits successfully but you don't want it to um, you don't want it to continue running it until or, or you don't want it to continue running unless it exits successfully and there was a specific stuff in the output so that's the compare output so basically all of this logic ends up here right this is the meat of our our, our logic that we're adding um so and this is and this is how we this is how we you know get access to the parsing functionality of this is how we're hooking into the parsing functionality of sphinx um so that we can you know add our custom logic in here right um so the, and this is just like i was saying so this is all about reading the stuff when you're when you're in these um uh directives right and the directives are the code block and the little literal include in our case um and then here we have the one about the file path so basically if you're if you're doing an inline file then you can specify the file path and it's basically going to take everything in that code block and write it out to a file right which is what we just saw um that is what we just saw here with the train.json and the test.json right so we put a little json code block and we said hey put that in test.json um 
And so all of this stuff is going to end up in temporary files uh, or in a temporary directory because for each document that we're testing, we end up taking, we end up creating a temporary uh, directory for it, right? To basically say, okay, you know, for example, I'm, I'm some user. I'm like, let me run this tutorial. All right, let me create some directory that I'm going to run it in and then let me start running my commands, right? Um, so now that we've parsed all the stuff, the next step is, okay, like how do we run this stuff? Right, so that's where the builder comes in. Um, and the builder, what the builder is gonna do is it's gonna basically go through all of these nodes that it found in the file, um, right? So it reads, it reads every, it reads every um, documentation file and then it says, okay, what are all the nodes? And the nodes are every time you have one of those blocks, That's that ends up being called a node. Um, and so then it just goes through the nodes and it, it, so it builds these little classes called commands, and then it says command dot run for each one of them, um, and uh, and so I mean that's the gist of how this whole thing works. Um, uh, then there's some special magic that happens within the test docs. Um, so the way it actually gets run, usually the way you'd run this is if you look at scripts docs dot sh. Um, so usually the way we run this, and this was some funky stuff that we did to avoid path issues, but usually it's like uh, Sphinx build, I think Sphinx build, um, what is it? Sphinx build, oh, dash B, HTML, docs, pages. So this was, this giant mess here is just to find Sphinx build. Um, so that's usually how we do this, right? And then that says, okay, use the HTML builder build it from the docs directory and uh, put the output in the pages directory. Um, now, so if we were to do this with console test, right, we'd say console test, um, we'd say build console test and use the docs directory as your input and use the console direct console test uh, output directory as your output. And that, I believe, I mean, let's see what the hell happens here, but okay, well, I didn't like that. <laughs> um, oh, and that's why I think we were doing the um, whole uh, giant. I think that's something, to, something, I think that error has something to do with this situation, which is it wasn't on some machines loading the correct versions of things. But the point is that if you run that, it's going to run, it's going to run that builder. Um, Ox, ext console test, which is going to build all of the, um, which is going to run all of the doc tests basically, uh, or run all of these console tests. Um, now, okay, so there's a bunch of code in here right now that I'm going to take out that was hoping to get full coverage information out of all of this, um, because, right, the thing is that. These are test cases, and it would be great if we got the line coverage for the CodeCov plugin out of this, right? Um, but unfortunately, it doesn't it doesn't persist through subprocess invocations. So if you start if you have a process running Python, right? If you're running Python using CodeCov and or using coverage and then you call subprocess exec another python file coverage is not going to persist through that exec um, so you're going to not get any coverage information there so we're not getting any coverage information out of this unfortunately which is really a bummer um, but eventually we'll we'll try to basically if they can fix that bug they, they maybe it, i've basically settled on it's easier to fix that bug in coverage than to do it in here um, it tried doing it in here and what happened um, I can't exactly remember what happened. Something, something, think bad things happened. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's so, so, oh, there's problems with the way that the iter tools library package resources, iter, so all of the entry point stuff, it doesn't, it doesn't know how to do, um, it doesn't pick up the changes to the system path. Um, appropriately and so basically like if you change sys.path uh, which is where python looks for all of the modules that it should load um, import lib has a function called invalidate caches which actually will make it pick up those changes however package resources um, it 
doesn't appropriately pick up those package those changes um and everything i did to try to do that ended up in fiery doom um basically what happens is and i ran into this problem before and you guys may run into this but you can end up in a situation where, where python loads two different versions of a module for two different modules and that i don't know that doesn't quite make sense but basically what happens is say i load okay so say i load and this is what happened is that we have util or we have util cli command right we have that stuff with the util commands right um now then we have this stuff with uh in ma the main slash cli dot the cli slash cli dot py right we have okay so when in dffml cli cli dot py right we have this stuff and then we have dffml util cli command dot py um so okay yeah in here so it starts it this is this is, gets so weird um but basically okay take this for instance um when we load these you you invalidate all the caches you say reload all the modules and then you try to patch package resources iter entry points so that it picks up the changes as well as all the import lib stuff well what ends up happening is that the the version of the command class here that's loaded is actually a different there's two instances of this class in memory the definition of the class in memory which means that is subclass now returns false here and this happens all over the place um and so it creates a giant mess um which is why we're not getting coverage information um but i'm sorry okay i'm sorry i took you guys down a long road here um but now you know how everything works um sort of um you, you pretty much got the gist of it there do, do you guys have oh and then the last thing i wanted to say is basically the that the builder stuff there's text docs text Okay, so this is some of the stuff that happens with the builder where basically I looked in the Sphinx code and figured out how they actually run one of these builders. And this is actually how Sphinx ends up running one of those builders. Um, and so what we did is we just made a, just basically figured out how does one run a builder and then run it program, pro, program, programmatically um, so that we can only run the build on one file because or else Sphinx, Sphinx will read the entire source tree of all of our docs every time, which takes way too long to parse all that stuff. We only care about parsing one file. So that's what hap That's what this code is in here, this MK test case or whatever it's called. Um, yeah, MK test case. So this basically does sets up the Sphinx build stuff um, and says, hey, only read, only read that one file that we care about building and then only test that one file um and so what we need to do is there's the the last little bit of work here that needs to be done is to basically say okay if you point to be able to to make a test case so basically abstract this stuff in this file into like util testing or something and then be able to point it at you know you can either point it at a, a file or you could point it at a class and then it would say, okay, take the class's doc string, put it in a temporary file. Now run the test on the temporary file, right? Um, so that, and then we need to go through all of the, all of the um, modules or all of the, yeah, all of the plugins and make it so that they're, they're doing this, right? And this is how we end up testing the docs for that class. Um, anyways, okay, so that was really long. Is there any questions on that? That's basically going to be my next thing, and then I'm going to document it, and then you, all everyone is going to do that going forward, right? So that'll be the standard procedure. Any questions or concerns or comments? So the problem with Sphinx, the code, the code core when Sphinx compatibility issue that you were facing is like, does code core really cover that what files, what scripts we are calling as sub processes right yep. now, or does it skip? Yeah, so that's actually, so here, I'll bring up the issue, and that way we can, because I would like to know where this issue is now. Um, um, so let's see. Uh, uh, 
Here we go. Okay, so this is the issue with coverage.py not going through subprocess um, .popen and and similar functions. Um, all right, and so basically, this comes down to uh, well, I'm not exactly sure what it comes down to, um, but some people tried to solve it. It's been open since 2010. Um, so that's not necessarily optimistic on this thing getting solved, um, that it hasn't been fixed in 10 years. Um, but uh, there's the, I, I mean, everything can be solved. There's like, you know, everything's possible. So um, it's, yeah, it's got to be, There's there's got to be a way to solve this. Um, actually, I'm kind of thinking that, uh, and you guys, I don't know if you guys, you guys probably didn't see this, but this is a random, I think this is a random. Oh yeah, this is on August dis distributed orchestrator stuff here. I can pull up the patch. Actually, it might sort of make sense what I'm talking about here. But um, okay, where is it? So I think that the solution may lie in something like this. Um, basically, when we start. Okay, so have you? I don't. Have you guys seen the multi-processing manager stuff within no, Python standard no, no. library? Okay. Um, Let's see. Okay, let's see. Does this one have it too? Or... Okay, no. All right. Um, and let me pull up the docs for. Or, yeah, let's pull up the docs for this. Okay, right, so this is fun stuff. Um, this is fun stuff. So, and it's fun to play around with. If you haven't played around with what's going on here, it's it's fun. Um, it's worth if if you're bored board one day and like oh, let me just go try something out this is fun um so definitely definitely something to, to check out and see what the hell is going on here um so basically what happens is that uh so the multiprocessing module is it used to, it's it's a good way it's it's the best way to actually run things in separate processes rather than threads um within python um and uh so it and 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 the main reason why you like to do one likes to do this is that like it says it sidesteps the global interpreter lock which is basically this per process thing that it's a it's a it's a lock it's like a um you know, what is it called like a um well okay how do you, um you guys well you guys probably you probably know the concept of locking right um I can't, I'm blanking on what the hell the right term that it goes under is, but um, like locking, what is it? Locking computer. Like what is, what is locking? Like what do you want to explain? I, I understand the concept of locking. Yeah, but okay. Yes. Oh, yeah. Like synchronization. Um, yeah. So, so basically, there. Yeah. To keep everything. Yeah. So, so Python has this this global interpreter lock, and and you can you can you can read. Okay. There's this guy that gives this talk. He gives this talk like every year about something that he calls the the, the gilectomy. Gilectomy. Larry. Larry. What is this guy's name? Yeah. Larry Hastings. Okay. Yeah, so this guy, this is okay. Okay, so basically, if you want to learn more about this, this is interesting. Um, I recommend, I recommend just watching maybe a bit of this. Um, okay. Um, go back to me. Um, students. Um, all right. Um, all right. So basically. This lets us run multiple processes, um, and as a part of that, some of them you you might want to share memory with some of them. Like some you you could have you may have you may start them all from the same place, in which case they might be able to share share memory. Um, now 
you could start them on different actual computers and then obviously they can't share the same memory so in that case they may want to work through like a networked situation um, and sometimes it's just easier to, to make them all work through a network situation because that's um, yeah, well you'll find out when you mess with this um, and so basically what we did here in this patch set um, in this patch was basically use this, um, use the idea of, of the fact that, so basically you can take, you can take various Python objects like in classes and expose them through this, this, um, this manager class. And then basically, and then what you can do is you'll, you'll end up being able to modify them in a different process or on it from a different machine as if they are on the machine that you're at. And it does, it does the appropriate locking and handles things for you. Um, um, and yeah, so I think this may be part of the key to, 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 you know, it could be helpful in this situation because basically you could exec a, you could exec a sub process and then when you exec a sub process, you say, hey, you know, is there a manager running around here? And if there is, then, hey, I want to, you know, connect to that manager and, you know, grab that coverage object and keep adding to that coverage object. Right. Um, I'm not sure, though. Then this is also very side tangenty. But, you know, I think that may be part of the solution to the, the coverage dilemma there but also at the same time it's not a giant problem um, it would be great if we could get the full coverage information right because right now our coverage stats are really just on the main um, package and we don't cover the we don't have coverage on the the um, the plugins right so it would be good if we could get that information and running figuring out how to orchestrate all of that uh, grabbing all that data and putting it together in the same place um, is also going to be tricky because things run in separate jobs and if you guys know this is something that i've been wanting to deal with recently but the, the installation of the dependencies is becoming a really long thing for all of these jobs um, especially for the ones that need all of the dependencies installed like the docs and the main package and some of these console test uh, entries um, so if you guys know in GitLab, I, you guys may have seen that, but in, in GitLab, there's this concept of a pipeline and it's kind of like with the mermaid JS diagrams, um, where you have, um, so the first thing you would do would be, um, build container image, and then you would, um, push image somewhere and then you would, let's see. Then you would um, yeah, then so then you would start the rest of the CI jobs, right? So you push the image and then start all jobs dependent on image, right? And so that image, so with all dependencies. Right. And so now basically what you've done is right, and then these would be, you know, uh, um the like you know docs cli dot rst right and these and this is like main package integration tests right things that things that where we need all of the all of the dependencies in it right or really quite honestly anything if we could just build it once right because now what's right now what's happening is you have like a good five or six minutes where it's downloading all of the dependencies and then it runs the test but then it does that five or six minutes happens in every single one of these it happens in every single one of our um uh checks here which now there are 71 of or not every single one but it happens in in a, in a substantial enough number of them right for all of these they just download whatever ones they require but then for the ones where they're integration tests, like I'm split, I also split all these out. So all of the tests will run in their own thing because it ended up running them in parallel and it runs like, I think like 10 minutes faster or something than it did without it. Um, yeah, 21 minutes and we're down from like 29 minutes, which was as we added more tests, it kept running, you know, um, in series and that was going slower. So now it's running them all in parallel um, for all these doc tests. Um, so basically, if you if you happen to know or come across a way to build the dependencies first, and then after the container image is built, then launch the the subsequent tests which which depend on the building of that image, 
please um please let me know or or you know uh add that here because that that would that would reduce the amount of random network errors that we're hitting um and and speed up the the builds i think so can you repeat your last line what so basically can so if you find a way basically if you if you find a way to if you okay so GitHub, so it'll be some kind of modification to this workflow file, right? And these workflow files, right, they say, okay, it runs on, you know, whatever the OS is, right? Well, there's also a way to say it runs on a container. And so if you find a way to have one of these jobs build a container, and then the next one say that it runs on that container, and for the ones that's, it, I, what I, what I want to understand is, is there a way to make the jobs that run on a container wait for the job that builds the container? I can't, I haven't been able to figure that out. Um, so if you figure that out, um, please uh, speak up. Um, and because that would be cool. <laughs> so yeah, that's basically what I'm trying to say there. So um, GitLab already has that. GitLab has that. Yeah, they have this concept of pipelines. Um, and so, yeah, if you check out their, their pipeline support, so GitLab pipelines. Um, yeah, they, I mean, GitLab is ahead of the game with this, some of this stuff. Um, Let's see, they should have a nice diagram here. No, come on, where's your nice diagrams? They have real nice diagrams. Okay, yeah, here. So yeah, they'll do like build and then test and then deploy and then deploy to production. Um, and so you can gate things and you can, yeah, it's more fully featured. Um, why GitHub has become so slow on adopting features, I guess, well, I guess I was about to answer my own question. It's because they have a much larger user base and things break more. <laughs> Can't do new features all the time when you're always fixing old stuff. Um, so I guess that, that answers the question there of why they may not have this yet. But yeah, so that's what I'm, that's what I'm hoping to find. Um, so if you guys find it, um, please, please let me know or just go implement it because um, that'd be great. So there was something like it was depend like one one test waits for the previous test to complete. Yeah, I don't know if they share they can share the containers. Yeah, that's the main thing, right? And I know that there's so there's this caching space that we have. Like we can cache up to five gigabytes, um, which is the other thing is that that yeah the other thing is that that it caches some of the pip packages right now. But we can't cache other things, right? And there's other things that we're doing, like installing stuff with apt sometimes. Um, and and all of that would be nice to be able to cache in one place, right? Because especially if this, this is the other thing, is that if this container image, so the container image is only going to change whenever the dependencies change, right? So if any of, and I'm about to basically take, this is the next thing before we do the releases, we need to be able to pin the version numbers on all of these packages, right? All of our dependencies. Because as we found, all of a sudden somebody updates something and then it's like, oh, well, crap, like something doesn't work, right? So and when we, we want when users to install the packages, it always gives them a known good configuration, even if it may be not the latest version of some dependency that, you know, they don't really care. They're, the whole point of this is that they don't have to care how they're using TensorFlow. They're using TensorFlow, right? Or PyTorch or whatever, right? Like we're, we, we abstract that away from them, right? So we need to be able to pin the versions so that only when we, we do a release, we talked about this, but only when we do a, like when we do a release, we pin all the versions so that users are always going to get the same stuff. And then when we're doing our development, we just have the version range say, you know, Hey, install the latest one so that we see issues in our CI, right. As it comes up. Um, and so the thing isn't is, it, what isn't it, po isn't it possible to like create a, were like cloud machine virtual machine instance with using some azure or something they already have that right github actions has support for that and if we can connect to that same instance and run the test would that be possible i'm not i'm not exactly sure i think that may i did see some stuff about that i saw some of the azure pipeline stuff um and intel i'm actually i'm part of the <laughs> I'm part of, you, you guys may think this is very unsurprising, but I'm part of the, I, I forced my way into the, the group of, of, of people trying to figure out what we're doing with the CI situation at, at Intel, um, because obviously I have lots of interest in making sure that we have good CI systems because we have now 70 or 68 CI jobs. So I'll be damned if I'm not figuring out <laughs> how we get the right CI system. Um, but 
it sounds like we may end up with support for that, but I'm also not sure. I, I think it's a paid situation as far as I can tell. Um, but if it ends up being something that's free, then it can be free, like as in paid, as in it won't work on open source projects, which is this is an open source project. Um, so I think it might be just for our private stuff that we end up with that. So I'm not sure if we're going to be able to use that, but if we can figure out how to do this in such a way that it's free, then we can hook it up to all of this. Um, so uh, can't we use the GitHub, GitLab pipelines in GitHub? Uh, I think there is a way to is use there a way to do that? that? I mean, we could mirror the repository and have the CI run from GitLab, which would be hilarious. I think, uh, but... We can use GitLab um, uh, pipeline yeah. stuff in GitHub. There is a way. OK. GitHub pipelines uh, in GitHub. Yeah, I mean, so if we can figure out, if we can figure out anyways, yeah, it's, it's kind of just, it's sort of, let's see, monitor your, no, yeah, so basically if we can figure this out, because I mean, I'm I'm not able to see it right now, but it may exist, right? Um, so if you, if you see, if you see, okay, you found it, great. Um, GitHub. Oh yeah, CI CD for an external repo. Perfect. Okay, yeah, but this also says premium silver and higher tiers, so that may be a paid situation again, unfortunately. Um, yeah, so maybe let's keep this around because um, this may, we never know, right? This maybe will work for us. Um, it's not, it, this is not a huge deal, right? Um, the other thing that I was thinking is we can also maybe make it so that we have this. Okay. So here's another alternative to this. Um, um, we make it so that we have, so, so this can, and this is the other thing which I was talking about, which is why this is kind of nice is because that container image is also a container image. It would also be the container image that we use to run CI locally, right? So we would know we'd have a uniform environment when we want to run CI tests locally. Um, and then it also, we could make it so that it, it does caching correctly. Well, and this is where it kind of gets tricky with the, um, the has is there been an updated package but i'm sure we can figure it out um but um we can make it we should be able to make it so that if none of the dependencies change then the docker image rebuild doesn't happen um and if the docker image rebuild doesn't happen then we that that six or seven minutes that's happening on the in, front end of every single test now just goes to zero right because we didn't even have to rebuild that whole docker image right so we should this basically the whole point of this is i want to it would be great if we could speed up the ci tests right because the the slower build and test cycle we have the better right um it's it's yeah but this is all sort of you know it's minimally it's minimally important compared to some of the other stuff that we have to do um but just i just wanted to put that out there in case you guys see something like that um uh Enter. All right. Okay. Now I'm, I don't want to take keep you guys too much longer. I'm so I'm ranting about. Yeah. Before caches. I forget, I I just wanted to ask one thing. I'll yeah. forget it later. Yeah. When you mentioned the core logic of what console test plugin you wrote, uh -huh. uh, isn't it really easy to like include uh, tests for Windows and Mac OS separately? Like it's, it's, you can oh, that's what I was, more. yeah, that's what I was supposed to be talking about there when I talked about the nodes. Um, so thank you. Um, so basically, yes, it should be really easy um, because the, we can uh, like add, you have that, I, I saw that options. Yeah. Thing, when you call it, you can just check whether some option yeah. starts with test. Mm -hmm. And then you can just add append the OSS to that test option only. Exactly. Like test dash window dash Ex test dash in Linux. Exactly. Yeah, that that would be exactly something that we would do. And actually, you know what? Even in what I'm thinking, what I meant, what I was trying to say when I was talking about all these nodes that it builds here, um, uh, 
you have access to the parent node. I can't remember how, but you have access to the parent node, which means that um, when you're in something like Docs installation, where we have these group tabs, you can tell if you're in the Linux one or if you're in the Windows one. Um, so that may be also a way we can do that. Um, but from the perspective, I think I think there's two takes on this from because I think the console test as a thing, it might be worth splitting into its own separate open source project um, if this ends up being, you know, if we if we find long term value out of this, I. I hadn't seen anything else out there that was particularly like it. There was a few other things, but they didn't quite give the same functionality, um, like the ability to start the demons and stuff and manage the Docker containers was something that it was. I need we need that right. Um, um, so I think it might be worth splitting into its own open source project. And from that perspective, people may not want the group tab thing. They may want it as an option, but I think we could also look at the group tab. Um, so yes, I think you're, you're spot on. I just wanted to say that there may be another way to do that too, which is sort of off your original idea of the group tabs. So no, we won't even need separate options, right? We can just append to this option and then append it to the list of platform checks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I think that sound that sounds right. Yeah. So is that the only change that will be required, or like is there something? That well, you know, on? okay. So here's the thing: is that all of the pipes and stuff is there's you know the way I have written a lot of things, and we've all written a lot of things is um, especially when I went through and you know redid some of these. It's I definitely used pipes a lot, right? Um, like pipes and T and right. So there's a lot of piping, and there's a lot of usage of uh like t um the t command um which is like okay but it's basically it'll come down to like okay some of these things use grep they use t they use curl right like is this stuff installed on windows right does windows have pipes and is it installed on windows and what i heard from someone at one point was basically windows doesn't have good pipe support um or something like that i can't remember um, I think PowerShell does, so we could just tell people use it in PowerShell if you need to pipe from one command no, to the other. I, what what I was asking is like about the library. Like, is the platform check here in the wrapper function enough, or like we'll have to modify something else in the console test library for um, including the test? You I run think, the yeah. Command. So I think the thing is that what we'd want to do is we'd want to do it in the builder here. We'd say. We'd look at this, so we'd build the, so those, the, that, that patching of the run, code block run stuff, um, that just does the parsing, right? And then we'd go in here and this, and then it, it builds all the commands, right? And then you'd basically say, hey, before you run, before I run this command, you know, you do something like if uh, system dot platform, uh, equals equals command dot platform right if if command is not none and system platform equals command dot platform then you know you run the command i think that's pretty much yeah right and then you're basically going to say command dot platform equals um it's going to be something like command dot form equals yeah, that's, I mean, I think that's pretty much going to be, and then there's one more place where you add it, which is down here, um, platform. Um, it's it's going to be roughly that is going to be pretty much your set of changes there. Um, but yeah, which is basically yeah, check the platform and then, you know, yeah. So I think I think that'll be pretty much it, right? Um, we'll need to go through and we'll need to put a platform on every single code block, right? Or we could just say, you know, it's probably something like the reverse, where it's like, okay, if it doesn't have a platform, then run it. If it does have a platform assigned to it, only run it on that platform, right? So this logic is probably not correct here. Um, but yeah, so, but I think you're on the right track there. Okay. All right. Um, so yeah, I guess that's, that's just sort of from what I'm doing, I'm going to basically go through and I'm going to, 
I'm gonna, I'll probably change a couple of these. Like I'll probably do like, you know, I change this one and I'll make it so console tests can do this stuff. And then I'm just gonna create issues because we have tests for some of this stuff right now. So then I'm gonna create issues and, or I'm gonna update the documentation and say that this is how we should do this going forward, right? Like this is how you test your doc string is by, you know, you do this import statement in your tests and you say console test my class, right? And then it'll test your class's doc string. Um, because uh, I think we wanted to add that to the new model tutorial under the packaging or whatever, or something like that. Um, so I'll do that and I'll document the console tests. I'm gonna pin the release numbers and then I'm gonna roll the release when that's done. If there's anything else that you guys wanna see in the, four, the 0.4.0 release, let me know. Um, I like, cause we can wait for it. Otherwise I'm planning on, I'm planning on <laughs> not leaving a gap in between because we haven't released since April. Right. And I want to get back to that goal of releasing, you know, even two, every two weeks. Right. Um, things just got way too, way too out of control. Um, and, and it needs to get back into lots of stuff in, you know, like less stuff in every release and more often releases. So that's my plans right now. And so just, you know, let me know if you if, if there's anything that we need to change before then, because, you know, like, God forbid, we end up with another six months release cycle here, then let's make sure that we got the right stuff in this last release. So, um, you know, let me know if things don't look right and, and we need to do more stuff. Um, and, you know, if you get the wind, obviously, it would be really great to see, you know, to know exactly what is supported and what's not supported for Windows so that if we do the release, we can say, you know, uh, to update that installation page and say, hey, Windows is, these things are supported on Windows, right? Because it, it already seems like, you know, we had somebody ask about Mac OS the other day and, and it'll be good if we, if we can figure out, you know, what is the list, if we can tell people, hey, you know, this is what's supported and what's not, um, that would be really great. Um, but, you know, I, I, I would also say we, we got probably another week or two maybe before I, I can nail all of this stuff down that I was talking about there. So um, if you if you complete it by then, that would be awesome. If not, then like no worries. Hopefully, we can get the next release out after that soon enough that then we put it on the docs. So all right. Um, sorry, I, was, uh, I know that was a lot of information. Um, so um, any cool. sweet questions, comments, anything else you guys want to talk about today? Oh, you give a lot of motivation for learning new things. <laughs> cool, cool. Yeah, I mean, I definitely say yes. It, I'm, I'm glad it came off that way. I definitely spent like an obscene amount of time fighting with Sphinx. So <laughs> the, the, the lesson here is it can be done. <laughs> uh, yeah. All right. Well, thank you both. It was great to talk to you both today. Um, and uh, hope everything goes well. And I'll uh, talk to you guys uh, later. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Thanks, guys. Have a good one. Bye bye.